Hi everyone, I'm Jay Chisholm. I'm the director of the Southwest Research Extension and Education Center here in Mount Vernon, Missouri. Uh, I'm excited to get a chance to give you a horticulture tour of our of our center, our research center. Uh, I was uh, appreciate Justin uh, giving me a call and giving me the opportunity. Um, I do have to say that Andy Thomas is our horticulture professor, our research professor here at the at the research center. And of course, most of the things that I'll be talking about will be research that he's either instigated or been part of, as well as some of your extension colleagues that are also uh, on do do work or coordinate with Andy and do different projects here at the farm. So again, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I've only been in this position since February. Uh, I formerly was with MU Extension as a, primarily as the Southwest Regional Director. I did serve uh, for a few years as an agronomy specialist uh, in uh, Polk County as well as in Barton County, Missouri. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started on our tour. I really can't say enough about uh, the Southwest Center without talking about elderberries. Elderberries really are things we actually talk about every day. Uh, because of uh, uh, the recent project that Andy was successful with. Uh, as you can see, that plant on the right, that's a Pocahontas variety, is actually in our landscape of, our, of the education center where people walk by and go into our, to our, for our programs in the area. Uh, and the, the picture on the left is there are students from, they're actually health science majors. They were in Monette, Missouri for what's called a rural immersion project where they spend three days and get uh, immersed into the kind of the rule, what, what it means to be, you know, in rural America, in rural Missouri in particular. Uh, and so hopefully the idea is that, you know, they would come back to, to uh, a rural community in, in, in some kind of health professional capacity, whether it be maybe a dental uh, office or a doctor, things like that. So that's in cooperation with our School of Medicine and, of course, Cox Health here in Monette. So elderberries rule the day, no matter who we talk to, we talk about elderberries because, and the reason Andy's smiling here is because he just received last year over a $5 million elderberry grant. Uh, so and I'd like to say that he just wrote that grant and was you know, awarded the money and it was an easy thing to do, but uh, I know that he actually worked on it for years. Uh, you know, he had to make several visions of several different types of proposals. Uh, you know, just can't even imagine the different things that he went through. But finally, elderberries became the fruit that a lot of people were interested in. And Andy had a proposal that was to USDA's liking. And so it ended up being just a, a win-win for not just our Southwest uh, Research and Education Center, but really for all of Missouri. When you, when you talk to people from other universities, from other states, if you say elderberries, anybody who's interested in horticulture, they know Missouri is where the research is being done. So, and that has to do not only with Andy, uh, but with uh, other horticulture specialists, of course, in the region as well. I know Patrick uh, Byers, uh, Kelly McGowan, and Robert Balick, they've all been involved somewhat with uh, elderberries as in our area, and probably many of you, many more across the state have been as well. So with that, I just, again, can't say enough that uh, uh, enough about elderberries. And so we'll start off our tour uh, by, uh, I'll give you, of course, that we're going to talk about these different fruits. Uh, we have, besides elderberry, we have uh, Kelly McGowan <clears throat> has a lavender project. We have a, a vineyard. We'll talk a little bit about black walnuts. Um, we'll mention our Ozark bananas, uh, persimmons a little bit, and some honeybees uh, that have been added to the, to the research center. So our tour really starts early in the spring, again, with elderberries. Uh, in our greenhouse, we were the plants that, that really were involved in this project. And this project wasn't just at our research center. It was also in New Franklin at Hark, the horticulture research farm, an agroforestry farm there. It uh, involved not just in Missouri, but in Illinois, also in Wisconsin, in Oklahoma. So a lot of different plantings uh, for elderberries across really the Midwest. So big project uh, has a lot of people involved and it really started at, in the greenhouse. In the greenhouse, we, we uh, the group, when I say we, uh, other people did it besides me, but the students and Andy and Caleb O'Neill, I'll show a picture of Caleb here in just a few minutes, where they actually stuck cuttings of different cultivars, different varieties of, of uh, of, of elderberries, and then they also raise some from seeds. So you can see a good shot 
our greenhouses are, are pretty primitive. I mean, we don't have any heat in them other than just the just what the sun provides. But uh, you know, elderberries are, are ideal for that situation. Uh, they rooted readily, you know, as the soil temperature warmed up, uh, and so for the most part, we were just real happy with it. And these plants end up being shipped uh, to all these other states. So it was a good, it was a it was a good crop for our greenhouse. Uh, and so again, the elderberry planting started far earlier in the year, and then it led to plot work. These were actually some plots also in uh, March and April. These were planted outside. There's many, many facets of this elderberry project. This, the, the pictures on the left and the right are really just, um, again, propagation studies instead of growing some plants in the greenhouse, just sticking some of the cuttings into the field. Uh, those are things I didn't know about elderberries that you could actually just stick a cutting in the field uh, with, and they're looking at whether it should be a one node or a two node type, or a, I guess it'd be a two or a four node type uh, cutting in these trials have several different cultivars they're looking at, you know, to see if you can propagate them this way. And all it goes back to the economics of elderberry production. You know, do you have to buy a rooted cutting? Can you root the cutting in the field? Do you have to have a greenhouse to root it? All those things are really part of it. I mentioned Caleb O'Neill because uh, in that picture on the right, the, the person in the that red plaid shirt, that's Caleb O'Neill. He's actually hired uh, with the, the funds from the Elderberry Grant, Andy hired him. He's been a great addition uh, to our team here. Uh, gets involved in a lot of different things uh, besides elderberries, but he uh, again does just a, just a wonderful job for us. And then uh, uh, standing beside Andy, Andy's in the white hat, and then uh, is Heike Buking. And Heike, of course, is the uh, Plant Science Division Director up on campus. She was uh, taking a look, and she was fairly new, I believe, and so. Uh, and Andy was just meeting her either for the first time or maybe the second time. And she was very interested in, in uh, of course, elderberry production. Along with, you know, along with these early plantings, of course, uh, Caleb and Andy really started to work on prepping the beds, prepping the ground, laying out some, some plot work uh, in the field, uh, some weed bear, things like that, that we could, uh, he has a lot of different things going on, variety trials and weed studies and insect studies. And all of these were different plots uh, that had to be put in the ground. So they did quite a bit of prep work early in the year. Uh, and that, that also meant, you know, irrigation. Uh, you know, a lot of new irrigation lines had to be dug. Uh, I mentioned Caleb was funded by the, the Elderberry the grant. Also, would like to mention that there are two graduate students that are also funded. The, their assistantships are funded by the Elderberry Project. So we're really glad, you know, Andy did a great job, you know, not only finding the funding, but then getting good graduate students to be started early on this project. And they'll be starting at Mizzou this uh, this fall. So he also utilized a lot of Missouri State to undergraduate students who were involved in the planting. So it's, uh, just about everybody has to do something with elderberries uh, just throughout this uh, from early, early spring uh, till now. We talk about elderberries, like I said, about every day. Uh, you can see the current slides were again of elderberries just looking at just a variety of things uh, and i can't even go into all of them but even even you know the health components of elderberries are shipping you know flowers to columbia and they'll ship fruit uh, to different places in the lab so there's a lot of different components of this project and you'll probably have to have andy come back and actually tell you those things if you're really interested but it would take a whole presentation on elderberries and i'm going to go ahead and talk about a few other things that I'd like to highlight on our horticulture tour here of the Southwest Research Extension Education Center. Uh, of course, this is a good shot of Kelly McGowan, who our horticulture specialist that's housed in Greene County. She actually got a Missouri Specialty uh, Crops block grant and on for to do uh, lavender in high tunnel. So she has a uh, several different varieties in the high tunnel, and the idea is to, you know, is this is a is this a good environment for, you know, to for lavender production. So uh, we're still early in this process. This was when they were first planted. They've actually grown some since I, we took these pictures. But, um, but anyway, we're really excited to have this project going on in the high tunnel this year. You know, also, uh, I was actually involved a little bit with some of the work on black walnuts. That, and so when I say the tour, I guess it didn't just start in the spring in Greenhouse. This was actually last fall. You can see Robert Balick, who's housed in our Jasper County office. That's Andy Thomas and myself, where we actually we're looking at a way, looking at you know different equipment to use on black walnuts. 
just a, a you know a kind of a low cost tree shaker that we could you know if does that add value to the walnuts by shaking the tree early you know could we gain a premium price you know based on the grading that Hammond's products provides so there's a lot of different things going on in this this walnut planting that Andy's had and I should say too that this walnut planting down there is probably 30 30 plus years old now uh, it was actually started prior to Andy uh, being there he did have to go in and regraft and really you know get the get the variety trial going uh, and so it's been you know so it's a 30-year planting it's probably one of the oldest variety trials that you'll see on eastern black walnuts and i really appreciate the work that you know that andy's done because you know he's collected the data for for this project for year after year after year on varieties uh, you know just uh, on so many different varieties and so it's really nice to start seeing, okay, here's some trends, you know, after these years. And that's unfortunately on black walnuts, it takes that long to really see see what the results will be in all kinds of weather conditions over these years. And then and now the next generation of walnut trees are actually planted here and also planted up at Hark, where you know now we you know we've taken the best characteristics of some of our trees that we grow down here and also uh, planted them now and crossed them so so the next generation so whoever follows Andy here at the at the research farm will uh, benefit from his work just like Andy did when he had that planting uh, when he was when he first came here uh, I will say you know when he when uh, uh, and Andy started it, uh, again it was, he's been here 28 years but uh, I was actually I wasn't with the university at the time, I was, but I was on the advisory board for the Southwest uh, Research Center, Southwest Center at the time. And uh, it was interesting that, you know, he was obviously he was a great candidate and we were glad to get him. But whenever I applied for my job here at the at the Southwest uh, Research Extension Education Center, Andy actually led the committee uh, for that, too. So you never know what, what how life's going to turn to. Uh, you know, in what circumstances are going to are going to get you where you're going to be, where you want to be. So, so I appreciate Andy. Appreciate the work he's doing here, uh, and the work that he's done for so many years on black walnuts. But uh, the thing that I guess that even though this seems like this tour started last fall, we're really the nuts in the middle are things that we're still cracking walnuts from the harvest last uh, last fall, where we're trying to determine, you know, the the, the cultivars that we we uh, were shaken or the cultivars that made that were naturally dropped you know what difference do we see is there any significant difference you know in that quality or you know or the yield of that so so a lot going on a lot of uh, uh, the students anytime it's anytime it was raining they cracked walnuts anytime it's too hot outside they cracked walnuts so we have a lot of people cracking walnuts all the time uh, because uh, it's just we not only did it with two cultivars but also uh, some a wild crop to see how shaking would work with them. So a lot going on with that, and it continues now. I would say too that uh, we not only did we look at the shaker, but we're also look you know trying to figure out what would somebody who if they were going to establish a, a black walnut you know uh, orchard or you know for nut production you know would they need something else besides just um, the nut wizards that you pick up and so we're looking at this piece of equipment um, that this is Josh Abercrombie who works at Hammond's products it's kind of he's actually picking up you know black walnuts with this machine so it's a walk behind machine that puts them in those baskets so uh, it doesn't haul them but it does get them off the ground and so we're just looking for different ways to commercialize something that the people pick up every year but could we do it different I should also mention, of course, we have a, a Chamberson grape trial. The Chamberson, of course, is a wine grape. Um, it, we have, it was originally two acres. We actually took out an acre this spring. Uh, we're anticipating another uh, uh, wine, another, I'm sorry, another uh, uh, grape proposal that we're hoping that uh, we'll get. Uh, we think there's some, there'll be some um, interest, some some private interest on a, a, new, a new system. So we took out one acre. We're still in that process. But the idea, of course, is that uh, the Chamberson trial, it's actually over, it's over at this point. So we're just, um, this is more just a demonstration plan at this point. It was a rootstock study, I believe. Um, and uh, Andy could probably tell you more about that if you're interested. A couple other fruits uh, that we need to mention. Um, of course, the pawpaw. We also called the Ozark banana. A very interesting plant. 
Um, you know, it was actually a, a plant that, uh, you know, a lot of people, of course, have never even tasted a pawpaw nowadays. But, but at one time, actually before World War II, it was pretty common for people to, you know, pick up pawpaws and put them in a basket. And so it was, and people even during the Depression, it was, a, it was something that, you know, people depended on. Uh, so these are, of course, we have a planting of grafted cultivars. You can see Shenandoah is a pretty good sized pawpaw. Unfortunately, it also has a big seed in it still, so there's a lot of genetics that needs to be um, adjusted somewhat to make it a crop that's really commercially viable. But still, uh, some some interesting work could be put into that. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, apples, you know, the, a red delicious apple or whatever type apple that you prefer nowadays doesn't, you know, it didn't start out that way. It just took a lot of years of, of selection and breeding, and that's really what needs to occur with the pawpaw. So, you know, there's, that's happening around the country and continues here at the Southwest uh, Research Extension Education Center, too. I, I put this picture on the left of, the, of a pawpaw. You can see it's been grafted. Uh, you know, pawpaws are actually graft easily, and lots of times Andy will show people how to graft by using the pawpaw because their, their chances of success are actually quite high with a pawpaw. So unlike a black walnut, where it's a much, much more difficult to get a high percentage. So pawpaws, are, again, are a big part of what we do here at the, at the research center. And then I, I should mention that we, have, we do have a weather station at the, at the, at the Southwest Research Center, but uh, we, we, we may not need it because I know Patrick Byers talks about the persimmon every year and he actually records, you know, what the seed looks like in a persimmon to, to predict the winter each year. So it's kind of an old wives' tale about what, what you can do with the persimmons. But there are there is a planting of grafted cultivars of persimmon also here at the, you know, kind of an underutilized, underdeveloped fruit uh, that still has potential here in the, here in our region. Of course, the newest addition, uh, this is uh, Patrick Byers and Amy Patillo. They started the Heroes for Highs program. I know this is a program that's been replicated in other, other areas as well, or, or I guess we've, you know, we've replicated other, other programs in the state. Uh, it's a pretty successful program. Uh, lots, of, lots of activity going on with that, so not too many weekends that we don't have some kind of activity with the Heroes for Highs program uh, working with Honeybee. I also want to um, go back to elderberries to finish up here. I should mention that this is, again, Andy on the left in this picture talking to, uh, he had this uh, really an uh, international elderberry conference uh, up in Colombia a few weeks ago, and people really did come from all over the world. Uh, somebody from Chile came uh, after the after this conference, came to this, the research station, uh, you know, wanted to talk more with Andy about it and, and just learn more about elderberry production. So a lot of interest in elderberries. So when I say that, because I think it's really important to remember that the horticulture work that we do, not just here at our research station, but the work that you're doing across the state has impacts or could have impacts around the globe. And the elderberry grant is really just a good example of that. So I appreciate, you know, what Andy's doing, but I appreciate what each of you also do uh, just every day as you go through your day-to-day -day activities. Sometimes we forget the impacts that we're having. And I always like to end, I wanted to end with a quote. And so I looked up online and this guy talked about uh, how important the elderberry was and, and all the different, uh, you know, the nutritional benefits and the medicinal functions of the elderberry <clears throat> for a variety of illnesses and just talked about all the good things. And of course, that's why elderberries are so exciting right now. And that's why um, USDA is also wanting us to look at it more. But, you know, we, I simplified this. I thought this was a better quote probably for us in the Ozarks, where I didn't put the whole quote in there, but it just says, feeling fine on the elderberry wine. And with that, thanks for letting me uh, join you in your horticulture tour. Thank you, guys.